All right, John's Gospel, chapter 14. I want to start reading, just to read a couple verses, and I read them last week, but let's read them again. Verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Let's pray together. Lord, we are interested in a supernatural work of your Holy Spirit this morning. We know that your um, the faith that you have brought us into is a supernatural one, Lord, and we need we need your power. We need your your grace in our lives. We need everything, Lord, that you have to offer for us to be able to live the life that you've called us to. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be open to what you have for each one of us, Lord. And um, I just pray you would break through anything that would be, hinder us from uh, receiving what you have for us today. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, last week, we started a two-part series uh, on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And I talked about how you either, you either most of the time, are, ex, are exposed to two extremes. Either you, one extreme is you never hear of the Holy Spirit. You never hear of the baptism with the Spirit. You never hear of, of needing to ask to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. Or you're in a context where all kinds of craziness is ascribed to the Holy Spirit. Unbiblical things, craziness, things that, that you would never, ever expect Jesus to do or say or be a part of. But there's a happy middle. There, there's, a, there's an area where it, you're not, you have to deal with either one of those extremes, that you deal with um, how God wants to fill us with his spirit, but yet uh, we're doing things biblically, decently, and in order, and all those things. And I want us to be open to that. We're, we're at this path, time where Jesus is it's right before he's going to be betrayed, just a few hours before he's going to be betrayed. He's preparing the disciples for his departure. So he's preparing them. He's telling them very, very needed, very, very important things. He's trying to get across to them that he's, it's to their advantage. He's going to say it in, a, in, in chapter 16, but he's going, to, he's going to tell them it's to your advantage that I go away. He's trying to give purpose to the fact that he's going away so that when he is taken from them, they, they're not made to stumble. They're not, they, they will scatter, but then they won't, they won't, you know, be permanently um, affected by that. We talked about three different prepositions uh, that describe in the scriptures our relationship with the Holy Spirit. The, the word with, the word in, and the word upon. That's what I want to focus on this morning. I want to look at those three different prepositions in relation to uh, our, our relationship to the Holy Spirit and, and give you scripture to, to understand kind of this progression that happens because the progression is he's with us before we're believers the holy spirit is and we'll read it the, the verses that jesus says talks about the purpose of that then once we become a believer he becomes and we come and dwelt with the holy spirit or the word in is represented by that he's in us and sometimes that happens at the and then when with that sometimes he comes upon us and, uh, and other times he doesn't come upon us at salvation. And later on, he, he comes upon us as we ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I want to show you all of that in scripture. Some of you may never have even studied this and never even heard that you could be baptized with the Spirit. Uh, and so I understand that we're coming from all different backgrounds. So I want us to walk through it because it's very important that we have power to be a witness. Um, and, and first of all, as we start with the with preposition, let's look at the end of verse 17 in our, in our text. Jesus said to them, for he, now the he is the Holy Spirit. He's a person. For he dwells with you and will be in you. So at this point, he is not in them. He's with them, but he's not in them. Uh, so the, the, the Holy Spirit, he said that, that the Holy Spirit will be in you soon. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit being with the world, what's the purpose? The purpose is, um, look at verse 7 there in John 16. It's, I have it on the screen here. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Notice 
It says, I will send him to you. Another point, he says, I'll pray the Father, and the Father will send him to you. Well, which one is it? It's both, because they're both God. That's, it's, that's, that's incredible. It's just like the one where, you know, the, who, who, you know, who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, the Father raised, it says, the Father raised Jesus from the dead. In John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, Jesus said, destroy this temple, in three days I will raise it up. And John adds that he was talking about his body. And then in Romans 8.11, it says, if the spirit of him who dwells in you will also raise your bodies to life. So the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead as well. So all three raised Jesus from the dead. And then John 10 says, if you believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead. So just that alone proves the deity of all three of the members of the Trinity. And there's other passages as well. So if you're ever on biblical jeopardy somewhere, you'll know that all three raised Jesus from the dead. No, there's not a biblical jeopardy. I'm just saying this for you in case you're Googling that already. Um, So what's the purpose of why the Holy Spirit is with the world, with us before we come to know Christ. It says in verse 8 of, of chapter 16, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So that's the main, the main role of the Holy Spirit right now is to convict the world of sin, talk about judgment, all righteousness that they don't have any. <laughs> uh, you know, the world doesn't have any righteousness that counts for anything before God. It's filthy rags, as Isaiah said. And so it's important to understand that when we're sharing our faith and we're preaching the gospel, and it, you see this, the more you experience you get with it, you're cooperating with the Holy Spirit. You're partnering with the Holy Spirit. As you're preaching the gospel to them, the Holy Spirit's compelling them that this is the right decision. The Holy Spirit's making a case to them that they're sinners and they qualify uh, need, of someone that needs salvation. And so you, have, you get better and better at at that and, re- and realizing what when the Spirit's at work, when you're speaking with them. But we make a lousy Holy Spirit, as has been said. We don't convict the world of sin. You know, we, we, we're not the sin police. And, and you know, that's the, that's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. And he does a masterful job of making a case that's inescapable in their own eyes. And that's the most important part about it, is that with, in their own eyes, that they know that they're guilty. The Holy Spirit says, you're guilty. I've had people I'm sharing the gospel with say, I'm feeling guilty right now. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that's good. That's good. That's the first step. How, do you, how can you be impressed with the cure unless you know you first have a disease? So, so that's critically important. So that's why the Holy Spirit is with us before we come to know Christ is to convict us of sin and talk about judgment, talk about righteousness, all those things. So let's, deal, let's look at the in preposition. You know, it, in the Greek, it's en, but in English, it's in, the in preposition. And, and so look at, um, we'll look at John, um, the, 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 point, the time when, when John chapter 20, when they received the Holy Spirit, the disciples. Let's look at that. If you want to turn over to John chapter 20 real quick. John chapter 20, verse 19 says, Then the same day, and all these scriptures will be on the screen, um, so you don't have to turn there, but if you want to, of course, please do. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So after he was risen from the dead... Couldn't do that before that. They were already clean because he'd already forgiven them of their sins. But they're the the unique people in the history of Christianity could have their sins forgiven, but not being dwelt by the Spirit because of the timing of of Jesus' resurrection and all of that. So there. So at this point, they, they didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. So Jesus is referring to this: He will be in you. He's with you, just like He's with everyone in the world. 
convicting them of sin and all that, but he will be in you. And the fulfillment of that was John chapter 20 that I just read. So he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to look at the last preposition because we've seen with, we've seen in there where it happened for the disciples, where they had the Holy Spirit indwelling them. Now we want to see upon because from this point on, all the all the scriptures that explain and talk about uh, the Holy Spirit's relationship with us, it's consistent that it's either the word filled or the word upon. They go together. And again, as I said last week, there are times in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit came upon people, but they were very specific people. They were kings, they were priests, they were prophets. They weren't the average person. Now, everyone that's a believer can have the Holy Spirit come upon them, empower them for service. This would be unthinkable to the Jewish mind to think that we could be, we could have the Holy Spirit uh, living inside of us and also coming upon us and empowering us for service. By the way, I want to tell you that John the Baptizer is the first one that talked about this, that the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Um, and I want to read that, that verse to you uh, in Acts. Uh, actually, it's in, um, I don't know where it is, but it's in the Gospels, uh, the beginning of one of the Gospels. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, Matthew chapter 3, there we go, uh, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So he talked about, John the baptizer did, that this one that, that I'm pointing to he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And the word baptize is just a transliteration from the Greek word baptizmo, which means to immerse. So they just carried that word over and made an English word out of it. It just means to immerse. So we're being immersed in the Holy Spirit. Um, and the purpose, I want to just remind us, the purpose of being baptized with the Holy Spirit is to give us the power to be witnesses to Jesus. I want to read again from uh, John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So they're, they're still thinking that he's a political Messiah. They're still like, when is this going to happen? We're tired of being under the Roman bondage and Roman control and occupation. We don't want it anymore. We see all these, these scriptures in the Old Testament talking about the Messiah ruling on the throne of David and conquering his enemies, they were so expecting and so wanting that. That's not why Jesus came the first time. The second time is when he came to rule the world, which he'll, he will do when he comes at his second coming. But Jesus' response in verse 7 was, And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, and the next word is our word, upon you. See that? When he comes upon, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So there's our third preposition. We've seen that the Holy Spirit is with us. We've seen the Holy Spirit is in us when we come to faith in Christ. And now there's a empowering that happens when he fills us with the spirit and he comes upon us. And that word upon, we're going to see that multiple times as we look at various scriptures uh, in the book of Acts. So the purpose, power to be a witness to Jesus. Power. The disciples had all the education they needed. They had all the practical ministry experience. They were sent out. Jesus sent them out for practical ministry experience, and he dispatched them authority that would allow them to do the same things he was doing. And so he, he, he gave them that, but he told them to wait when he ascended to this day of ascension. He told them to wait for the Holy Spirit to come so that they would be empowered. So this upon experience would, uh, would, would be empowering them so that they can be the witnesses that they were called to be. God knows we're leaky vessels. God knows that we leak and he's, in, he's totally into free refills. I remember when, 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 when refills were a thing. Remember, remember how revolutionary that was and all of a sudden, we can go back to that thing as many times as we want. You know, and we always, you have to just fill up one last time before you're about to leave, you know, and you just want to get all that's coming to you, all that you can get. I want to have, it's like three cents for a, a, a cup, you know, of, of soda or whatever. 
But God loves that. God loves the fact, and we're going to get into the scripture that, that, that talks about us to be continuously being filled with the Spirit and how we're filled with the Spirit. Uh, we're going to get into that as we go along. But we desperately need power. We desperately need boldness to proclaim the gospel. We always think of this world as the worst it's ever been. It's not the worst it's ever been. It's been pretty bad before. It's been, it's been horrific. And, and the Roman Empire was way worse than any government that we've ever experienced or seen in this planet. And they were threatened. None of us have our lives threatened because we're preaching the gospel. And they did. And, and, you know, and I believe it's in Acts chapter 4 when they, were, they went back and they prayed and they asked for boldness and God filled them with the Holy Spirit again. This is after Acts chapter 2 when they've been filled with the Spirit. So this upon experience... When did it happen for the disciples? We need to see that first, right? It was the day of Pentecost. Let me read it for you in Acts chapter 2, and you can turn there if you'd like um, to be able to see when this happened. It says in verse 1, Acts 2, 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Remember, John, the, the baptizer, said, I'll be baptized you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So the tongues of fire that were above them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And from this point on, the disciples were different. Remember when they were before they'd seen Jesus raised from the dead, they were locked behind locked doors. They were fearful. They were scared. After they saw him raised from the dead, and then after they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, 50 days later, basically, you see them bold. You see them stand up to kings. You see them stand up to people. They, they were filled with the Spirit. They were dependent upon the Spirit, and the Spirit gave them power to say, I witnessed Jesus raised from the dead. And they didn't get anything in return for that. They didn't get money or power or fame. They got persecuted. And, and, and then eventually they got put to death. And they never wavered on their testimony. No one dies for something they know that is false. They knew whether or not Jesus rose from the dead or not. And, and, and if he didn't raise from the dead, then why are they risking their lives when God couldn't even raise himself? He's not going to be able to raise them. It's very strong um, argumentation for the validity of, of the resurrection. But we need to be bold. And this, this, this world is wicked. It's been wicked this whole entire time. And, and, and so we're called to speak the truth. He's left it up to us. It's amazing that that was his best plan. You know, but, he, but, but the reason why it, is, it was his best plan is because he can give us the power and he does all the work. When we preach the gospel, he does the work. We don't. We're just delivering mail. We're just delivering the message. And his Holy Spirit convicts the world. His Holy Spirit compels them that Jesus is the right answer. Oh, man, it's so great to be able to preach the gospel and to share with somebody and have the light go on, you know, and have them, their lives changed and then see them grow and changed supernaturally. And they're so shocked that they're changing from the inside out. Can't believe that God is speaking to me. Can't believe that God is, is guiding my life. And it's so wonderful. They're shocked. I'm like, Jesus is real. That's what you're experiencing. He's real. You believe, then he manifests himself. He doesn't manifest himself first. And then you believe. It's the opposite of how we would expect. So that's when it happened for them. And, you know, the... the the, the upon experience, that can happen at salvation, and we're going to look at an example of that. It can also happen subsequent to salvation. We'll look at examples of that, actually four examples in the book of Acts. So let's look at the first one where it happened at conversion. Um, turn with me, if you'd like, to Acts chapter 10. And the rest of these should be, for the most part, in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10. Now, this is the account of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was a centurion. He was in the Roman army. He was a, a God-fearer. He wasn't a proselyte. He couldn't be a proselyte and be in the Roman army because he, ha he wouldn't be able to obey the feasts and all those things. So he gave alms. He, I mean, he gave gifts and, 
and, and God saw it. He said, your, your, your alms have come up as a memorial before me. And he worked out the situation where he, he sent his servants two days south from Caesarea to Joppa for Peter to come and preach the gospel. Peter was on the roof. It's the first time that the Gentile gets saved in the book of Acts. And the, 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 even the apostles, and later Peter has to explain himself at, you know, in Acts chapter 15 to at the council of Jerusalem to explain that God did this. It wasn't even of him, and, and God had accepted the Gentiles. And that was shocking to them because they weren't reading their Old Testament. They weren't understanding God's heart and his fulfillment of what he said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with their descendants was directly connected to spiritual descendants. And they were, they were descendants because they were faith, of faith. And so that's how Abraham would have all those descendants was because of the Gentiles getting saved. So they weren't quite tracking with that yet. And Peter's on the roof there in Joppa. God had already worked greatly in his life for him to be at the house of a tanner. That would be considered unclean and not allowed in the Jewish faith before. So he's staying with him. He's on the roof. God gives him a vision and he lowers a blanket with clean and unclean animals. And he says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, not so, Lord, which I, I talked about last week. That's an oxymoron. Not so, Lord, doesn't go together. And, and finally, he, he got, the, got the, what God was trying to do, talking about that he'd made, if he makes the Gentiles clean, that they're no longer unclean. He can do that. So he went with these people because right when the vision was finished, there was a knock at the gate. He went down off the roof and he wasn't just hanging on a roof like we would think of a roof. They, had, they built their roofs to where it was a, another living space. Uh, and so he got down from there and he walked a couple days to Cornelius's house and he opened his mouth. His whole house was gathered there. He preached the gospel. And then it says in verse 44 of Acts uh, uh, 10, or yeah, 10, uh, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So this is the one example, excuse me, that I know of in the book of Acts, where the in experience in the Holy Spirit indwelling somebody and coming upon them happened all at the same time. So this is an example of that. And, and he gave them... Um, the gift of tongues and these outward things so that they can know for sure that God had accepted them. He was doing more than one thing at once. He was, it wasn't just giving them gifts of the Holy Spirit that they would use. He's actually showing Peter and the other believers that were there that God had accepted them because he gave them the gift of tongues. And, and so, so that upon experience happened there as well to them, not just the in experience, but the upon experience. This is what happened to me. When I was 20 years old, walking into a church, I was pursuing a girl, okay, not Sandy, uh, sorry, just wasn't Sandy, and I went in there, and when the Lord, I wasn't up going up to the altar, I wasn't doing any of that, I was just, God was t talking to me directly, your life's a mess, you're not on your way to heaven like you think, all of that was very shocking to me, I'm 20 years old, I was just like, I want to date this girl, that's why I'm coming to church, you know. And then I, I realized that everything that my sisters had said to me was true. God was saying it's all true. And I said, okay, I, I trust you for salvation. I want all you have to offer. Boom. I'd never experienced anything like that since. And I received the gift of tongues and I never had heard of that gift before. I didn't know what was happening, but it was happening. And um, I was concerned that the people around me, we didn't believe in whatever was happening was of God. It was great that they ended up believing that, but... So I had the in and upon experience myself. Uh, I wouldn't ask for it to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what that meant. And, and he, he did it. Um, so I wanted to show you that. And then I want to show you now four different places. Well, you know, we're not going to go to four different places, but four different examples where we, someone receives the upon experience subsequent to 
salvation. The first example is the, the disciples themselves. We've already looked at that. John chapter 20, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's when they were, had the in experience, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts chapter 2, because in Acts chapter 2, it says when Jesus promised the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, he said the Holy Spirit will come upon you. He uses that preposition. And then it says they were filled with the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. So filled with the Spirit and the Spirit coming upon you are synonymous in, in, in the Scriptures, in the, in the book of Acts especially. So that's the first example. Second example is Saul of Tarsus. Remember, Saul of Tarsus was traveling to persecute the Jews. He was very good at it. He excelled beyond all of his Jewish brethren. He caused them to blaspheme. He approved their deaths. Uh, he was, he was uh, like Hitler, basically, um, causing so much um, you know, damage and hurting people. And, and when he was on this road to Damascus, he was blinded. Jesus appeared to him. And the, his, Jesus' glory outshone the Middle Eastern noontime sun. That's how bright the glory of Jesus was, and it blinded him, and, and, and he, he fell to the ground. doesn't say he was on a horse. doesn't say that. He could have been, but it doesn't say it. So when you're in Bible, when you're doing Bible um, you know, trivia, you just got to watch yourself. Uh, just to let you know, just take that as a note, be- benefit, uh, extra that I'm just throwing in there. So anyway, he was blinded, and he, he, he talked to the Lord. And that's when he received Jesus as his savior on the road to Damascus. But then later, God sent Ananias to go pray for him that his eyesight would be restored and he'd be filled with the spirit. He was also baptized. And we see that in Acts chapter 9, verse 17. You can turn over to that if you want. Acts chapter 9, it says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he laid hands on him and he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. But he had already been a believer. He was a believer on the, on the road to Damascus and received Jesus as his Messiah when he's blinded and Jesus spoke to him and he calls him Lord and everything. <clears throat> so that's another example of someone being filled with the Spirit subsequent to salvation. The third example are the Samaritans. If you look in Acts chapter 8, um, we're told, we're told in uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 17, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. When Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached, the, preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, who who previously practiced sorcery in the city and, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with the sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Okay, so they were saved and they were water baptized. Verse 13. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John came down. They were sent to make sure these people had, were baptized with the Holy Spirit because received the Spirit was a euphemism or a figure of speech about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. They already were water baptized. They're already believers. They've been water baptized. And this was so important that they, Peter and John were sent down to Samaria to be able to make sure that they had received the spirit in the sense of the upon experience. Verse 16, for as yet he had, um, as, for as yet he had fallen upon, notice our word upon there, none of them. 
they, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they didn't, hadn't had the upon experience. They've had the in experience. They were believers. They trusted in Jesus. They've been water baptized, but they'd never had the upon experience. And it was so important that Peter and John came down to make sure that they had this power to be witnesses to Jesus. Then it says in verse 17, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Again, they had already had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They just hadn't had the upon experience. So then, then Simon the sorcerer gets all impressed with that and wants to offer money, wants his power. G, uh, Peter rebukes him and, and all of that, and, and he deals with them. You don't want to deal with Peter in a bad way. Like, it just doesn't work out well for you. Ananias and Sapphira found that out, uh, and that's what happened with um, this man here. So that's the third example. The fourth example is the disciples uh, at Ephesus. In Acts chapter 19, Uh, if you'd like, you could turn to Acts chapter 19. The Apostle Paul is at Ephesus there, and we're told in verse 1 of Acts 19, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Do you receive, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, he's talking about the baptism with the Spirit, the upon experience. So they said to him, we have not much so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into, then, uh, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came, there's our word again, upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So they hadn't been, this is the situation. They had believed, but no one had water baptized them yet because they would have heard the baptizer, whoever would be baptizing them, mention the Holy Spirit because we're supposed to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So they hadn't been water baptized yet. That's why you see Paul baptized them, water baptism. Then he laid hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So this is the fourth example, the fourth and final one that I know of in the book of Acts. So you have the disciples, you have the apostle Paul himself, as Saul of Tarsus, before he he became the Apostle Paul, you have the Samaritans through Philip preaching the gospel. Peter and John came down, prayed for them. They'd already been water baptized. They were already believers. And then the Spirit came upon them. And then in Acts 19, Paul comes across some believers in Ephesus who had believed but hadn't been water baptized yet. So they were water baptized and they had the Holy Spirit um, come upon them. So, I just wanted you to see that for yourself, see that it's, there's scripture to back all of this up. Um, but the question is, how do I receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit? So glad you asked. Turn with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Now, Jesus is teaching on prayer. Right before the passage we're going to read, he's telling, talking to him about the Our Father, how to pray the Lord's Prayer and everything, and approaching God. And he continues after that and says in Luke 11, verse 9, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread, From any father among you, will he be given a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So, what is this talking about? Is it, I mean, some people say it's talking about salvation. The problem with that is that at salvation, you're not asking for the Holy Spirit. This is talking about you specifically asking for the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, you're asking for forgiveness. 
And then God gives you the Holy Spirit and he indwells you. There comes a point in time, though, uh, sometimes it happens at salvation some, where you're given the Holy Spirit in the terms of the upon experience and you're given boldness to be a witness to him immediately. But oftentimes it doesn't happen at salvation. And then you come and you ask for the Holy Spirit in the sense of the baptism with the Holy Spirit and then later ask to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. And that this scripture is relevant to that as well. In the Jewish mind, the ultimate gift that you could ever receive would be the Holy Spirit. To be the holy of holies would be unfathomable. To be able to think that God could come in and live in me and, and, and dwell me. And then to come upon me and give me supernatural gifts um, would be quite something. So maybe you're here and you've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit. So how do you know if you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Do you have boldness to be a witness to Jesus? Do you, do you have power to be a witness? When, in other words, do, when, you know, do, you, do you shrink back when it's time to open your mouth? When it's time to be bold, no matter what the consequences were? So, we, so we, we measure whether or not we should say something based on what we perceive is going to happen, the results or the implications of us opening our mouths. And we weigh that. And God says, just if I'm telling you to share, you need to share. You need to stand it for me, no matter what's going to happen. You know, this, this country, is the, the religious freedoms are being eroded constantly all the time. And there's going to come a point where it's going to cost us something to share our faith. So are we going to be bold when, when it costs us something? Or, I mean, look at right now. Do we, do we share our faith when it doesn't cost us to share our faith? And I, I, think, I think it's searching for us to think about. We are, we, God didn't just save us to give us this wonderful life and to hoard the blessings of salvation on ourselves. He didn't do that. I, I wouldn't be preaching this Bible if I said that. Because clearly he says, don't allow your, your light to be hidden. To, 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 to be bright and to shine bright in this world, which means we're going to offend people. We can't worry about, we're going, we don't go around purposely, recklessly offending people and not using tact, not using, our, you know, being spirit directed and led. We don't do that. It's foolish. That's just asking for problems. But if we're being led by the spirit and, and he calls us to open our mouth and we're, we're, we need to open our mouth and share, do we have the power to do that? Do we feel like we're a witness to him in that way? So only you can answer that. I can't answer that for you if you have power to be a witness. And so that's why we need to be filled. But we also need to be refilled. And maybe that's some of us today where we need to be refilled. We have been baptized with the Spirit before. We've had that boldness to be a witness. We've stood up for God. But now we need to be refilled. And also we need to be refilled when we don't have the power to obey God. And there are times where you're in a situation, you, you know you don't have the power to obey what you know is God's word to do. And that's when you ask to be refilled with the Holy Spirit, and he gives you power to do it. It's uncanny how it works every single time. Every single time of 34 years of knowing the Lord, it's, it's happened. It's worked. Where, where I sense I don't have that power, and I ask, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. And he gives me the power to do it. I want to read to you a verse from Ephesians verse 5 or chapter 5 verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the spirit. Now the Greek construction there is continuous action. So he's saying don't be drunk with wine which is dissipation but be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. Well he's telling him to do something it's actually in the imperative mood, which means it's a command. So he's commanding them. Well, if it's up to them, if they're filled, how, how are they filled? They're filled because God says to ask, to be dependent upon him, to submit themselves to the Lord and ask to be refilled with the Spirit. Sometimes I don't, I don't know what to say, and I need to say something to a believer. And I'll ask in my heart in that moment for God to fill me with his Holy Spirit to be able to have the right words to say because they need the words that I have to say in that moment. I don't always have the right words to say. You guys can testify to that. Uh, but I'm trying. I'm trying to get better and better all the time. But it requires us to be filled with the Spirit. So we need to ask. So I want to call the worship team up here and I'm going to have them play one song. And um, 
if you sense that you need to be baptized with the Spirit or refilled with the Spirit, and this doesn't have to happen in this way. You can do it by yourself, alone. It doesn't have to happen in this way. But if you want to, right now, you feel prompted by the Lord to ask to be baptized with the Holy Spirit or to be refilled with the Spirit, I'm going to have you stand and have people around you pray for you. Um, please pray for them where they can hear what you're saying. Um, and pray for, pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit or refilled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we're a family here. This is the living room. We're all lo- we all love each other. Um, it, just because you don't stand doesn't mean that you're, you don't want that. So we're not judging anybody. We just want to give an opportunity for you to stand if you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, if he gives you a prayer language, if he gives you a language that you don't know and you hear these words in your mind, and, and it's not you, it's from, you know, obviously someone beyond you, the Lord, speak them out. And I'm not saying everyone has the gift of tongues, but you, know, you may be given the gift of tongues. I mean, every single one of these, you saw tongues and prophecy and all these things that may happen. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit here. Uh, uh, so, so be bold and sp- speak them out in faith. It's not like you say, who stole my Honda? 30 times and somehow you prime the pump and it gets it going or that's all carnal that's all ridiculousness god gives you these words and you speak them out and it's your spirit praying that's actually what's happening when you're speaking in in tongues so let's do that now before we take communion